Cast first, WRBL News 3 First Alert Weather. Hope you're doing well tonight. We're still tracking some showers, some moderate, some heavy at times, but the threat of anything strong to severe is out of the area. So anywhere south of West of Columbus, look at this, Macon County, Bullock County, you're kind of seeing that rain hanging on all of Russell County and Barber County and going into Stewart now and into Chattahoochee County and Southern Muskogee, still that light rain. And it's uh, kind of all lifting up towards the northeast now just a little bit. It's so having a little bit of a little edge on that because of this front that's working in. So that'll be real nice. And we're going to talk about this system clearing out temporarily, but there's still more unsettled weather ahead, and we're tracking for you coming up. You're watching WRBL News 3 on your side. Straight ahead, a trip to the bank to deposit cash from his convenience store and gas station turns deadly for a Columbus man as he's gunned down right in the bank doorway. Next, former U.S. Senator David Perdue breaks his silence, announcing he will run for governor of Georgia against fellow Republican Brian Kemp, what's fueling his gubernatorial run. Plus, New York City implements one of the most wide-reaching vaccine mandates in the nation as health officials monitor the spread of the Omicron variant. News 3 Night Watch starts right now. On your side, this is News 3 Night Watch. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for trusting News 3. I'm Teresa Whitaker. Columbus police have launched a homicide investigation after a shooting tonight killed one person and injured another. Police say the shooting happened shortly before 8 o'clock on 23rd Street near Hamilton Road. Muskogee County Deputy Coroner Charles Newton confirms 32-year-old Marcus Jones was killed in the shooting. Another person was sent to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. This marks the 66th homicide in Columbus so far this year. The city's 65th homicide took place less than 12 hours earlier when a robbery occurred outside a bank when it turned deadly. The incident happened just outside the entrance to the Synovus Bank located in the 4500 block of Buena Vista Road. The bank is right next to the Columbus Police Department's East Precinct. News 3's Sacra Gray joins us now with more details. Sacra. Teresa, 45-year-old Amit Kumar Patel was the victim of this deadly robbery. He was the owner of the Chevron gas station on Buena Vista Road, just about a mile from the scene of the crime. He was gunned down this morning in broad daylight at around 9.30 a.m. Muskogee County Deputy Coroner Charles Newton pronounced Patel dead on the scene just after 10 a.m. According to police, the shooter took the deposit Patel had on him. Muskogee County Coroner Buddy Bryan knew the victim and his family personally and says Columbus has lost a hardworking, upstanding citizen. Columbus Mayor Skip Henderson says law enforcement is working quickly to get the offender behind bars. You know, it really hurts um, to know that an innocent man was gunned down in broad daylight. Just trying to do his job, deposit money from his business, and go on to work just like all the rest of us try to do. The police department, our sheriff, every, every law enforcement official in our community is absolutely committed to trying to make a very quick arrest and uh, make an example. So it's, it's, um, you can put them away for the rest of their lives if you can. And Teresa, like you said, this was Columbus's 65th homicide so far this year. That's 21 more homicides than the city had back in 2020. Teresa, right back to you. All right, thank you, Sacra. Anyone with information about this ongoing investigation is encouraged to contact Columbus Police, and you can find that number listed on our website at WRBL.com. We're going to keep our eye on Columbus, where a local businessman drew a crowd to the government center steps this afternoon as he announced his bid for mayor. John Anker owns a Columbus manufacturing and packaging business. He says he wants to apply that business mindset to the mayor's office. So far, Anchor is the only announced candidate for the 2022 election. He was flanked by his family and campaign manager, local businessman Jay Pitts. I'm not running against any particular candidate or political party. That makes me really happy. I want to run for Columbus. Yes. It makes me happy. I'm running for office because I have a vision for what I believe Columbus can be if we you and me, roll up our sleeves together, talk together, and pray together, and work together. Together we can win. 
Columbus Mayor Skip Henderson told News 3 he will seek a second term, but that announcement won't come until early next year. The nonpartisan mayoral race will be decided on May 24th, the same day of the Georgia Democratic and Republican primaries. The Georgia Republican primary is already taking shape as former U.S. Senator David Perdue joins the race for the governor's mansion. In a campaign video released this morning on Twitter, Perdue took aim at Governor Brian Kemp and Democratic challenger Stacey Abrams. Take a listen. I'm David Perdue. I'm running for governor to make sure Stacey Abrams is never governor of Georgia. Purdue's announcement comes nearly a week after Abrams, a Democratic politician and organizer, announced she would run. Abrams narrowly lost to Kemp back in 2018. Purdue says he doesn't think Kemp could beat Abrams a second time. The former senator has repeatedly been encouraged to run by former President Donald Trump since Governor Kemp's refusal to overturn the state's presidential election results in 2020. Other Republicans who have joined the race include former Democrat Vernon Jones and GOP activist Candace Taylor. Continuing our coverage tonight of the fight against COVID-19, COVID infections are quickly rising in the U.S. and as the new Omicron variant continues to spread, some states are taking action to slow the spread. Skylar Henry has more. We are not going back to what happened in 2020. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio is now expanding the city's vaccine mandate, requiring all private sector employees to get the shot. This is how we put health and safety first, by ensuring that there is a vaccine mandate that reaches everyone universally. The first in the nation mandate is set to take effect in just three weeks. It includes new guidelines requiring children between ages of 5 to 11 show proof of vaccination for indoor dining, fitness and entertainment venues. So long as they've gotten uh, that first dose by December 14th, they can continue to participate indoor dining, entertainment, all of these great things. Beginning today, the Biden administration is now requiring travelers coming into the U.S. to present a negative COVID test taken one calendar day before departure regardless of vaccination status or nationality. Now we're like, well, do we wait? Do we do our test today? Do we do it tomorrow? While the Delta strain of COVID-19 remains dominant, several mild cases of the Omicron variant have popped up in more than a dozen states. We really got to be careful before we make any determinations that it is less severe or it really doesn't cause any severe illness comparable to Delta. While scientists say there is still much to learn about Omicron, Early indications out of South Africa, where it was first identified, show being vaccinated and boosted are the best defense. Skyler Henry, CBS News, Washington. As we head into the break, we want to thank you again for trusting News 3. Coming up, ground is broken on the site of the new Mount Pilgrim Baptist Church as a 137-year-old house of worship moves to make way for progress. But first, let's check in with Bob. Here's the front. This is storm system number one. We have two more that are a little bit stronger and you're going to see it. We're going to highlight it coming up, but as it pulls through, we get a bit of a break, but then that rain kind of comes in sporadically. So tomorrow's kind of hit or miss kind of a shower and then by tomorrow night and evening, you're going to start see it ramp up, which could really increase in intensity right through the early hours of Wednesday. That's what we got to watch out for coming up in this first floor forecast that's coming up next. News three is on your side with Teresa Whitaker, Phil Scoggins, Chief Meteorologist Bob Jeswald and Sports with Rex Castillo.
on your side. You're watching WRBL News 3 Night Watch. It was a significant morning for a historic African American church that has long been one of the cornerstones of South Columbus. News 3's Chuck Williams was there as the congregation of Mount Pilgrim Baptist Church broke ground on their new home. To God be the glory. And with that, 137 years of spiritual history will be moving from one Southside Columbus home to a new church just off Far Road. And as Mount Pilgrim is prepared to make the move to make way for a new interchange at I-185 and Casita Road, Pastor David Stallion says the new foundation is a firm one. This is the foundation of a new era um, for a new season in the life of Mount Pilgrim Baptist Church. Uh, it's the start of what we're hoping to be the beginning of a new development in this community where we can continue to do what we've been doing for 137 years and that that is to be a presence in Columbus, Georgia. This day was two decades in the making and it didn't come easy. More than 20 years ago, this historic black church uh, said no. And they meant no. <laughs> When Pastor Stallion took over, talk started again with the city and the Georgia Department of Transportation. They were all looking for a way to open up Casita Road to the interstate. And we've all developed a partnership where which we have agreed on uh, the greater cause, and that is to bring about development in this community. Stallion says what happened Monday morning on what was being called holy ground was determined a long, long time ago. This is the day that the Lord has made, and as the Bible says, we will rejoice and be glad in it because it is the day that he has decided within his own wisdom from the beginning of time, and now we are here, and we're thankful for it. Chuck Williams, WRBL News 3, on your side. Pastor Stallion says the Mount Pilgrim hopes to be worshiping in the new sanctuary by next Christmas season. You're on the Night Watch and there's more news ahead. Bob's going to have your first alert forecast coming up for you in about three minutes. Hurt by a big truck? 1-800-CALL-KEN. One call, that's all.
your side. Chief Meteorologist Bob Jeswald has your first alert forecast. So the rain has been persistent and hey, we can't complain. I know it was a little disruptive for some sports events you'll hear coming up. But here's the thing, the rain is certainly necessary and it at least didn't bring us the severe storms we had or tornadoes that were off to the west in Tennessee and down near Mississippi this afternoon. But this is how it looked like when it came down. It never fails. You know, you haven't had rain, but when you get it, Frank Dillard Sr. captured this over on Moon Road today. Just a wave. Look at that, that wind blowing, 35 mile an hour winds is whipping with this heavy rain, torrential rain, and it is standing on the surface. And in the, our own Teresa Whitaker's dashboard cam, capture this, something we haven't used in a while. The windshield wipers. Have you checked your windshield wipers? It's a safety thing. You should really check it, especially when it gets dry, get a little dry rotted out there. So could there be a little thunder coming out of this forecast? Yes, and here's why. We're going to look at this area of low pressure coming up tomorrow night, roughly around this time. It starts to become a little bit more unsettled again, especially in our southern counties. That low kicks out and then another one gets ready and poised to come in here as that front lifts right over our area. When it's draped like this, this is the track and it'll become the conduit of all kinds of energy riding along that. Does it mean severe weather? It could have a couple strong storms, not really going weather wear on this yet. But again, it's worth noting Wednesday morning, it's going to get a little bit wet. So you have to get out there. Keep in mind early commuters. Oh, Wednesday morning is going to be tricky. Now watch. The low comes to the south. If it does go south, it'll kind of more or less pull all this energy out. This is Wednesday late morning, Wednesday afternoon, voila, sun, clouds, and it'll become sunny. It'll be really nice. We get a little bit of a break here Wednesday and a good chunk of Thursday. Then Friday afternoon, showers becoming sporadic from a little weak low coming in. That should pass farther south, so that'll bring in more clouds for Friday. But Saturday night is more potent. That's coming out of the Rockies, another Pacific storm system riding right along that jet stream as it dips farther south. Stronger front means it's going to sweep through with showers and storms. That will be late Saturday into Sunday, and uh, likely it'll be meteorologist Cody Nickel myself if things get a little busy. So 74 degrees for high, low of 51. You got some 60s out here for highs, averages, and low of 42. So we're obviously quite mild out there, and we captured almost three quarters of an inch just on average and more rain is on the way. Look at this as it continues to add up. So if you're looking for that rain, especially in our southern counties from Barber all the way back up to Sumter County, you can bet your bottom dollar we're going to get some more rain. So some fog, low clouds, some upper 30s to low to mid 40s. Our northern counties where it's cleared, it's going to be colder in the morning like Troop County. So we'll go 46 in the middle of the road tomorrow. A chilly day with those 50s out there, maybe some upper 50s. I'll be a little bit better in latitude, giving us a little bit more in the temperature department. So I'll go about 59 degrees here, 63 at that sun coming out Wednesday. And Teresa, look at us. That next system comes in Friday. It gets a little cloudy, sporadic showers, maybe a storm. But that's Saturday night and a Sunday. Then we'll clear out the second half of the weekend. It'll be nice. All right, Bob, thank you so much. Thank you. And stay with us here on the Night Watch just ahead. Curbside garbage pickup is coming to Lee County, Alabama, the last county in the state requiring its residents to drive to a dumpster.
on your side. You're watching WRBL News 3 Night Watch. A major change on the horizon for Lee County's solid waste system. The county is transitioning from dumpsters to curbside service next year. Residents have complained for months that dumpsters around the county are overflowing. Take a look here. Lee County engineer Justin Hardy says that's due to an influx of garbage from surrounding counties. In June, the county commission awarded a nearly $1.8 million bid to Arrow Disposal to begin curbside trash pickup next year for nearly 18,000 customers. They have eight other counties in the state that they also service. The vendor has multiple size trucks. They won't send, try to send these large trucks down these narrow one lane roads. They're going to ride the roads, establish their route. And so when the carts go out, there will be information on the cart at each residence that says when they intend to start. Arrow Disposo will begin distributing cans in February with service to begin in March. The current garbage collection fee of $18.50 per month will stay in place for two years. Jack Patterson in now with sports, and it was the final four time for the Pacelli Lady Vikings. Right, Jack? That's right, Teresa. An opportunity to play for a state title on the line. Coming up, we'll take you to Atlanta for the showdown between Pacelli and Portal. The highlights are yours next. On your side, Jack Patterson with WRBL News 3 Sports. Hey everybody, what's up and what's good? You can say the championship season rolls on here in the Chattahoochee Valley, this time in flag football. The Lady Vikings of Pacelli play for a shot at the state title. In their way, the Portal Panthers. Now change of venue due to bad weather, so Portal and Pacelli playing at the Atlanta United Training Facility. 
first half of Chelly's Tamaya Carter direct snap. She sneaks in for the touchdown. Vikings lead a six zip at the half. Less than 30 seconds to go in the game. Portals Emma, Emma Yates drops back. Hits a wide open Blair Brandon for the touchdown. We are tied up at six. Now Portal going for the extra point and the win. But Pacelli's Kalen Salmon swats the pass away. And y'all, we need overtime to decide this one. Now Portal, they'll get the ball first in first overtime. Gates finds Brandon once again. They connect for the touchdown. Lady Panthers lead 12-6 at the top of the first overtime. Pacelli needs this one. Score on fourth down to extend the game. Carter drops back, lets it fly. We're actually a little bit behind. That's a touchdown for um, Portal to take the lead. And then Pacelli here on fourth down, game on the line, lets it fly, but the pass falls incomplete. Portal wins it 12 to six in overtime. Pacelli's season ends in the final four. Now over to college football, it's not only bowl season, it's award season, and the Heisman Trophy Award finalists have been announced. Alabama quarterback Bryce Young, Pittsburgh quarterback Kenny Pickett, Ohio State quarterback C.J. Stroud, and Michigan defensive end Aiden Hudson will all head to New York City on Saturday to see who will be named college football's most outstanding player. Young could make Alabama the sixth school to have back-to-back -back Heisman winners. Devontae Smith won it last season. Now over on the Hardwood, Hawks on the road, taking on the Minnesota Timberwolves. Hawks by seven in the first quarter. But yo, if you're gonna give Trey Young that much room, it's 10 now. Late in the second quarter, Georgia's Anthony Edwards driving the layup. It is no good, but Carl Anthony Towns with a ridiculous putback, that is good. That makes it a 15 point game. Hawks by 13 in the third quarter now. Timothy Luau Cabarro, he's wide open for three. Count it. He had 23 on the night. Hawks up by 16. Next time down the court, John Collins wide open for three. Bang. Hawks up 75 to 56. This 108 98. Hawks down the fourth. Collins open again for three. Yes, sir. That is your dagger, ladies and gentlemen. The Hawks take it 121 to 110. They snap a two game losing streak. And coming up on the latest edition of the On Your Sidelines podcast with the New Street Sports team, join sports director Rex Castillo and myself on Tuesday afternoon, where we'll have Kyle Sandy on as our guest. As football season winds down, basketball starts to take center stage, and we'll catch up with one of the authorities on basketball in the state of Georgia. If you love hoops, you don't want to miss this one. This is going to be WRBL.com live at 3 Eastern on Tuesday, and Spotify, Apple, and iHeart later this week. And a quick reminder that for the latest sports news and late-breaking headlines, you can follow the News 3 Sports team over on Twitter. There you can find game highlights, score alerts, and much more. Head on over to WRBL Sports, and you can follow us there whenever we're not on air. That's going to do it for your look at sports. The Night Watch is back on the other side of the morning.
on your side. You're watching WRBL News 3 Night Watch. As we approach International Women's Month coming up in March, WRBL wants to recognize the important contributions that women have made to our nation and to our local economy communities. Remarkable Women is part of a nationwide Nextar Media initiative to honor the influence that women have had on public policy, social progress, and quality of life. To nominate a remarkable woman in your life, all you have to do is go to WRBL.com and fill out the nomination form. Bob is joining us now with a final look at our forecast. You got it, Teresa. Take a look at this. This is the, uh, of course, the Santa Claus Classic, and this was last night. Where the holidays, most folks think of eggnog and Christmas cookies, but last night, runners celebrated the holidays by going, woo, and lacing up for the 12th Annual Santa Claus Classic right here through Fantasy and Lights. Hundreds of athletes turned out for the event, dressing in holiday costumes for the 10K race, and runners ran to the tune of all kinds of Christmas music. And of course, Callaway Garden's Fantasy and Lights continues to the very end of this month. A lot of fun. It was good to see everybody turn out. All right, Bob, thank you so much. And thank you at home for watching News 3 Night Watch. Good night. Sleep well. Georgia. I'm John Crow with your Cash 3 Cash 4 Fantasy Finite Drawings. First, let's play Cash 3. Your first winning number is 3. That's followed by 7, and your final winning number is 4. Again, if you have the numbers 3, 7, and 4, you just won. Now let's play Cash 4 and see if you can win again. Here we go. Your first winning number is 9. That's followed by 0. Up next, we have 7, and your final winning number is 6. Again, if you have the numbers 9, 0, 7, and 6, in any winning combination, you did win again. On to Fantasy 5. Tonight's jackpot is an estimated $503,000. Your numbers are 33, followed by 6. Up next, we have 1. That's followed by 29. And your final Fantasy 5 number is 28. Again, those numbers are 33, 6, 1, 29, and 28. Here are tonight's Cash for Life winning numbers. 19, 25, 42, 52, 55, and the cash ball is 1. 